You're all invited. Um, Stephen is turning 80 next year to Malawi. We're going to have a big party in the long way. How many adopt children have you got? 15. 15 and 5 children. Yes. He's got 5 children and 15 adopted children. So it's going to be a big party. Start saving up in Lelongwe next year at his 80th birthday. I mean, you're all invited. Go, Uncle Stephen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Do the African response where you pull down this hole. Hallelujah. Ah, if football fans can shout, we need to shout better than football fans. Is that right? They shout for that round thing, the ball. But we shout for Jesus, this name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's better. That's the African way. I was in Germany last year in October. <clears throat> And the church was half full. The people start sitting from the back. And it was half. And there was a long distance from me to the people. So I lifted up the podium right in the middle where they were. And I asked the ushers to remove all the chairs which were empty in front. <laughs> so I had to move over to them. Uh, because they start from the back, you know, sitting in the church. And that's a bad habit. If Ramaphosa was here, would run to sit next to him. But if Jesus comes every Sunday here, we start from the back and leave him alone in front. So I had to go to the people and remove all the chairs which were empty. So I want to thank God this, uh, this evening that uh, we are together and uh, we want to enjoy Jesus. Don't enjoy Stephen. If you talk about Stephen, you have lost it. Completely lost it. But if we talk about Jesus, he's the main guest of honor tonight. So we want to lift up his name. Because he's worth of all the praise and glory and honor. And so don't talk about this thing because I'm just like a plate. If you eat lunch, you don't go to the plate and say, thank you. <laughs> you are mental sick. <laughs> you say to the person who cooked the food, is that right? Yeah, so this is just a plate, a vessel carrying the message of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Greetings from the best woman in the world. My dear wife. She sends a greeting, says I must say hi to you, and that she's praying for us. And she has my schedule, and uh, she starts, you know, going on a little closet at 5.30. So right now, she's on her knees praying for us. And what a great woman of God she is. And I want to thank God for her, that she was a special gift. She has been a special gift into my life. And uh, I am as I am because I can speak in English today because of my wife. It takes a great woman to teach her a husband. Uh, and it also takes a humble man to learn from the wife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because we men, we have got the male ego with a baritone voice. We don't want to be challenged, to be taught. But it takes a great man to learn from your wife. There are great teachers in their humble way to teach a husband. And so we thank God for you ladies who have husbands, and we really appreciate you. We cannot do without a wife. A wife is a great woman in a man's life. And we thank God uh, that uh, God blessed me with my wife. I thank God. Amen. So receive greetings from her, and uh, she's praying for us and encouraging us in her prayers. Let's go to 
Mark chapter 10, last week I had uh, one of the sad moments on one part, but uh, full of joy on the other part. I've had an evangelist who had been preaching together for almost 40 years, and we called him a dancing prophet. A dancing prophet because when he's preaching, he likes dancing with his messages. So we, you would enjoy him when he's preaching because he's so passionate about the word. And uh, so we named him the dancing prophet. And last week on the pulpit on Sunday, he preached the most powerful message. And over 200 people came forward in tears, broken before God, and led them to Jesus on Monday, he had gone to glory. Suddenly he died. And there were about 10,000 people at his funeral. It was a big crusade where, you know, the message was preached and many people lifted up their hands. So many people were born again at his funeral um, when he, I mean, when the preacher made an appeal. And what a way to go to glory. And uh, I'm, I'm praying that I won't die now. I'm still preaching. <laughs> so some were saying amen if you can die. <laughs> yeah, but if I die, it's a joy to go to, to glory to be with the Lord. That's what I look for every day. That uh, I must die, as I say to my children, if I get old, I'll still be preaching when I'm 90 or 100 years if my eyes get blind, I'll ask my grandchildren to read the scriptures for me and to preach the word. So I retired, but, you know, I'm more refired in the Lord, <laughs> having more meetings now than ever. So I, I'm more busier than before. So I'm excited about preaching. I love preaching. And every weekend I'm preaching elsewhere. During the week, I'm at the marketplaces with my trailer and the loudspeakers preaching the word of God to see thousands of people coming to Christ. That's the joy. And also, if you can make me your missionary as well, because now I, I don't have a ministry or somewhere where they pay sorry, I live by faith. And I can tell you testimony after testimony of what God is doing in our lives. And uh, so I'm excited tonight to share with you uh, my testimony. Last time, first time when I came here to share my testimony, I read this scripture, Mark chapter 10. If those who remember Mark chapter 10, that's where I based all my... But today, I will speak it in a different way Still my same testimony. And uh, so let's go to Mark chapter 10. <coughs> Is there a second service after this? Oh, so I can go to midnight. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so there's no need for a watch. <laughs> oh, my. I'll try to keep your watches, you know. I want you to invite me again. <laughs> Mark chapter 10. And as I said, I love this because when I started reading, it was, I read my first verse was 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, chapter 5 verse 14. That was my first verse ever when God opened my eyes to read his book. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, for the love of Jesus constrains us, pushes us. You don't want to go, but that love constrains you, pushes you to move you to do the things you would not want to do in the natural man. In the natural man, you don't want to do, but that love of Christ constrains you, pushes you to do things you shouldn't have done in your natural man. People ask, well, where do you get the boldness to speak to someone in the plane? It is that love that constrains me not to zip my mouth, but to talk about him. 
because I love him too much, too much. And so I can't zip my mouth. And I like talking about Jesus. And I remember when I fell in love with my wife when she says yes to me. Oh, my. I was like, yeah, I had the feathers, you know, flying. <laughs> oh, someone has loved me. Someone with a degree and loving. <laughs> someone without education. A big gap. A big gap. So I wept when she says, yes, I love you. I don't care we don't have a house. I don't care you don't have a home or what. You are rejected, but I still love you. I wept the day when she says I love you because I felt unworthy to be loved. And she was the first woman who loved me, who gave me that hope. Hallelujah. And, uh, and so because she, when she said yes, I didn't know what to say next after that. And I said, well, then I was terrified by eyes. The more she looked at me, I said, oh, God. <laughs> so I said, let's pray. And I prayed the longest prayer you have ever heard. Each time in my mind, I said, if I say amen, then she looks at me. What would I say? <laughs> so the prayer was almost one hour. <laughs> Yeah, and my vocabulary was terrible, terrible. The verb was going this way, adjective was going, noun was going this way. Everything was mixed up. <laughs> but God was smiling in heaven and said, oh, my, my son, I can send my Holy Spirit to correct your English <laughs> and bring it to me. <laughs> so when it was arriving at the throne of grace, it was a perfect English. <laughs> but spoken down here, broken English. <laughs> That's what God does. Amen. So I'm excited today that uh, from these chapters, God has used. So first time I preached on this was to share my story. But the main verse which I used before was verse 49, where the Bible says, Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. <clears throat> remember last time when I was here, those who remember, I said when Jesus stops, all the hosts of heaven stop, all the angels. They stop, they look down. Why has Jesus stopped? They look down, but also they remember the words of Jesus that there's so much joy in heaven when one sinner comes to Christ. So they were looking down as I came forward with my AK-47, with all my bombs, with all my hatred and bitterness before God. I didn't like the name of Jesus. I didn't like, I didn't love white people. I didn't like even those people who are well to do. But that night when Jesus stopped for me in tears, Broken before God, angels were saying, hallelujah, for one sinner who has come into Christ. Wow. So tonight, the angels are waiting to dance for someone here. Do you say amen? amen. Someone is going to make angels dance. Someone is going, you know, angels that don't dance do, they don't dance the European way. No, Europeans don't know how to dance. <laughs> they dance like statues. They think that... <laughs> no, Africans, we know how to dance. You take us to Zulu, we know how to lift up. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> ah, man, a white man will fall backwards. <laughs> wow. But angels dance for one sinner who comes to Christ. And I know tonight, heaven is ready to dance. Hallelujah. Yes, but Mias was by the roadside. Everything went as usual. Daily routine. And he would go by the roadside to beg. But the little he got 
from people, they vanish like mist. They didn't stay long. So he has to come again and again and again and again and again and again and again. But also, you would hear voices. You would see the beauty of creation, the beauty of faces. No, he was blind, pitch black. But he had to depend upon someone to take him from point A to point B because he was blind. Every time someone has to drag him from point A to point B. And that's the picture of many people we have in our churches. They need someone to drag them, to drag them, to drag them to somewhere from point A to point B. But sometimes you are not dragged into the church, but you are dragged to some sinful ways, to drinking, to smoking, to womanizing and so on. So you go out of your will because there is something dragging you to that point. But tonight, we thank God, according to these scriptures, every day he had to beg. He was a lonely man. A beggar is always a lonely man. You always asking questions, why me? Have you ever asked a question, why me? Why me? You go through situations in your life, you say, why me? I've asked those 101 questions. Why my mother? When I was born, she kept me nine months in a belly. And then at labor pains, she struggled to have me through those labor pains. And then four years later, after breastfeeding me, she dumps me in the streets. And as a street boy, I was asking these questions, why me? When I would look people speaking at English, I mean speaking in English, I would say, why me? And I saw people laughing. I said, maybe they are laughing at me. So when you are a nobody, you think when people are talking their own issues, they are talking about you. You feel like lost, depressed, and uh, and three times I wanted to commit suicide because of this why, 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 there were too many. You don't have the answers. Some of you are here, you are coming from a broken marriage and after holidays, you don't know where to go. To go to dad or sometimes to go to mom. You are split up in your life and you ask the question, why me? Why me? Sometimes people have got married and they are in a marriage, but they thought it would be heaven on earth. But you didn't know that you, you didn't marry an angel. You married a human being with 101 mistakes. <laughs> and your first week you got married. Uh-huh. What? <laughs> and you, as a man, you want to run away. And you tell your, your wife, I'm coming in a minute. You are running away. You're not coming in a minute. You are running away. How many people go to their friends to just for a chat, running away from a husband, from a wife? You thought it was going to be heaven like you see on the, uh, on the TV, Hollywood movies, happily married there after. <laughs> they don't tell you the other side. <laughs> Are we together? They don't tell you the other side. It's so beautiful, it's so glamorous. But you know, here in the scriptures, but me are sitting by the roadside, blind, asking questions, why me? I was like that, asking questions, why me? And you sit by the roadside under a bridge, you are stinking, you are smelling all the time you are, you know, scratching yourself. All the lice had all their breakfast and lunches on your body. And you ask, why me, God? Why me? And so here, <coughs> the man <coughs> sits by the roadside, verse 46. Then, as he said by the roadside, Jesus, 
Jesus, man, oh, I love this name. Eh? When he appears in your life, when he appears in your life, your hopelessness goes away that moment. Your helplessness vanishes that, that moment. Because this name Jesus, in his hand, he has all the blessings in heaven in his hand. Not on his left hand, but on his right hand. His right hand has all the blessings. Healing on the right hand. Deliverance on the right hand. Taking Egypt out of, I mean, Israel out of Egypt, right hand. Crossing the, the Red Sea, right hand. When he blesses you, he uses the right hand. So tonight, God he wants to stretch out to your life. Your life today is, no, is not going to be the same because God is ready to touch you tonight. But he's looking for someone who say, enough is enough. I can't go on like this. I can't go on depressed and defeated all the time with all this in my life, the challenges. Tonight, enough is enough. I want to meet with Jesus. You know, the difference in your life comes not with a degree. Degrees are very good, but they won't change you. The education won't change you. You can accumulate all the different degrees, the PhDs, whatever they call it, to the end of it, if there's the end of education. <laughs> but you won't have peace. You won't have peace. You'll still be depressed. There are many scientists who have gone too far with their education, but they are still depressed. They are looking for something better. And some to hide away from that, those challenges in their life. They end up saying, there's no God. They think they've had it. They know it all. But it's like an ant trying to study me. I mean, that ant is foolish. I can just stamp your knee and die. But he's trying to study, who is this huge thing called Stephen? <laughs> a little ant. And he's moving there. And it comes to give me a little bite. And, and he's looking. It wants to lift me into the little hole. <laughs> but it's wasting his time. It's like when you stand up because you have accumulated your degrees and so you say, there's no God. I mean, God can just say, uh, <coughs> full sake, man. <laughs> <laughs> just one step, you are gone. Yuri Gagarin went into the space, and he says, I've been to the space. I didn't see God. He insulted God. Few months later, it was not a spaceship. It was a single aeroplane. Single engine, driving, I mean flying. He crashed and died and met with the same God. He was blaspheming. The Beatles, they say, we are popular than God. A young Beatle who was shot six times, died in his popularity. You know, you can blaspheme God because God can crush you in a minute. So, but me as, City by the roadside. The Bible says, I love this. Are we together? Verse 47. Are we together? Oh, it's on the screen. Oh, man, you are sophisticated. Hey, I'm only primitive person. <laughs> wow, the Bible says, man, I like it. Ooh, this is good. <laughs> the Bible says, when he heard... I put a different color. When he heard, underlined, circled it. Wait, because my brother, there's no way, my sister, there's no way you can hear about Jesus and remain the same. Never. You either reject the name of Jesus or you love it. Two things happen. You either love and embrace the name of Jesus or you, you hate it. And so when he heard, when you hear there's something that happens inside you, 
It's like when you hear the name of Jesus being insulted, what happens inside you? You feel like angry. You feel like, man, I can grab this man if God gave me the permission to pray for this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh. That's what you feel. But because God fights his own battles, he doesn't need your help. He doesn't need your help. It's only a dead God you have to fight for. Like this other religion, you know, they have to fight for their prophet. Now, we don't have to fight for Jesus, no. Because he's God. He can fight on his own. <clears throat> and then, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, he began to shout, my brother, my sister, that's the message I want to share tonight. He began to shout. He used his lungs. He began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mess upon me. My brother, my sister, you don't cry for mercy when your bank account is good, when you are doing very well academically. When you are everything, you come from a good, well-to-do family. You don't cry for mercy. When you are coming, everything is paid for. Once, for all, the whole year. Others are struggling to find the school fees. But you cannot cry for that mercy. Because everything is well-to-do in your life. I was in Australia. I found one school which was really a top, top school. It's called King's King's uh, School, uh, King's College. All the students there, young students, it's not a university, high school. Young students come with a BMW, convertible BMW. Little boys, I said, wow, and I stood there from Africa. Huh? <laughs> One car, car. Huh? another, huh? <laughs> old ones, huh? Huh? <laughs> Hallelujah. But these boys, when they came out, one just left the doors open. He walked away. This, this roof goes like this on top. And the boy is going away with his bag. And I looked, the car is closing on his... Uh -huh. <laughs> well to do. Wow. I mean, you ask that boy to cry for mercy. He doesn't know it. It is not in his vocabulary. Maybe you are here tonight. Everything is well to do. You have no time to cry for mercy. But tonight, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Wants to touch your life, change your life from that lifestyle to where you worship the king of kings. What a glorious moment it will be. Wow. Then he started to shout, Jesus, son of David. And then verse 45, many rebuked him. Many rebuked him. Maybe he had to try to stop people. Please take me to Jesus quickly. Take me to Jesus. They said, no, shut up. Even the disciples of Jesus may be they told him to shut up. You are making noise for the master. <laughs> you are making noise for the master. People come, shut up, keep quiet. Tula, man. Unga kulum. And this man, the Bible says, he shouted all the more. Tonight, our theme is shout louder. Amen. Shout louder. Because the people who are stopping you to not to shout, they don't know how to be blind, what is to be blind. They don't know what is to beg. They have never experienced that. They are telling you to shut up, but they don't know your challenges of blindness. Some, they've never walked with clashes. They've never been on a wheelchair. They tell you to shut up. Some, they've never had financial challenges. They are telling you to shut up. 
Shout all the more. Shout louder. Don't let the crowd distract you from what you want. Because Jesus, when he was passing by, he was not going to come back to, Jer to Jericho. It was the last time he was going to come there. So the only time, the only chance was that time. Maybe tonight. That's your only chance. Jesus is passing by tonight through Stellenbosch. Still through here tonight. He's passing by. But don't let him go without touching your life. You have the challenges in your life. People, you, they laugh at you when you, you have a wonderful marriage. Everything is going well. They laugh at you because your husband is cheating. They don't know what to be cheated in the home. They don't know the cry you have when you are being cheated at home. They've never experienced that, and yet they laugh at you. They laugh at you. They don't know those challenges in your life. Some, they go through all these challenges where you are an orphan. They've never been rejected in their lives. They laugh at you. They don't know those challenges to be an orphan. Or maybe you have been growing up for years, but recently you discovered you are an adopted child. It brought pains in your life that you are an adopted child. You are crying inside. Nobody has ever experienced what you are experiencing tonight. Nobody. But Jesus, but Jesus will stop for you tonight. Hallelujah. Jesus will stop for you. My life was like that. I used to say, I'm an orphan. I was rejected. Why my mother rejected me, dumped me when I was only four. And I look at other kids that are going to school with their school bags. I would sit by the bridge and watch them. I wish, I wish I had parents like those. Some of you have got both father and mother. But others don't have. And they are struggling. I wish I had a father and mother. I wish. And I used to cry when my friends, they would run to their parents. Their parents hug them. They give them sweets. And I would sit there. I wish I had a father and mother. Have you ever cried like that? I wish the challenges you pass through, nobody knows about them. But me, I used to cry. And also when they are in the evening we are playing their goal, uh, they go to their homes and I'm thinking they are going to sleep under the bed sheets in the home. And then I'm thinking going under the bridge on the cardboards, mosquitoes, sleeping with snakes sometimes. One day I took a knife to kill someone but not knowing that I had slept with a big snake. And when I woke up, this snake goes over my belly all the way in the bush. I, froze, I froze. As, and then later I said, I wish that snake just killed me. You wish you died. You look for death, but death doesn't come by. You are struggling. Nobody understands you. Nobody even thinks about you. Like a beggar, you give the little change, you forget about him. I was desperate. I preached at, uh, at, Penta, uh, I mean, at White House from desperation to discovery. <coughs> I've written a, a small booklet on from de desperation to discovery. That I was a desperate young man. Almost want to commit suicide. But I discovered this name, Jesus. When the Bible says in Genesis 39, that when Joseph was sold by his brothers, God was with him. You know, when God is with you, man, problem becomes no problem. Hallelujah. When God is with you, problem becomes no problem problem. 
and you take those problems as stepping stones to a higher level. When you are tested by your own brothers, when you go through situations, they are taking you to a higher level. When they watch you, they go see you going higher and higher and higher. That's what all my enemies, my friends, my all people who hated me, my life was going higher and higher and higher. First time I had a dream and I found myself preaching in that dream in London. <coughs> And it was written Trafalgar Square. And then I didn't know how to write. So in my dream, I saw it so clearly. When I woke up, I literally took a, a ballpoint to copy in my mind what I'd seen. But my R was looking this way. The E was looking the other way. You know, I was learning to write. And my friends said, it looks like Trafalgar Square. But you, not educated, you can never be in London. Never. I said, but what, that's what I saw. Because when I go to Trafalgar Square in my dream, I was going backwards. And as I went backwards, watching these statues of lions. You know that place if you've been there. Of lions. So there's a fountain behind me. But I'm going backwards, and then I step on the foot of someone. And I said, I beg your pardon. Now, this man had a long beard and the tiny little cigarette still holding it with his lips, still burning with smoke. And I apologized, and I started preaching to him in my dream. Seventeen years later, I... Billy Graham invites us to the conference in Amsterdam. And I went to Amsterdam the first time to fly to Europe. Then we went in the hall like this one, where there was only carpet, we were resting. And we said, uh, we said, hey, we need to sleep and relax. So there were two white guys, and I, they asked me to sleep in the middle of them with, you know, putting our conference bags as pillows. But he said, for us to sleep quickly, let's share our testimonies. You share, then you, but we share with our eyes closed. When we hear that you are quiet, you have slept. <laughs> so, so we decided, the first one shared his testimony, and then came my turn. And I'm sharing my testimony, I'm sharing my turn, not realizing the two white guys are seated all watching at me, and our mouths are still closing. I think all my friends are still sleeping. No, they, are, they have sat down. <laughs> Listen to my test. Both of them, they are crying. So I said, oh, because they are quiet, they have slept. So let me look at them. And I see them sitting. I said, you guys, you cheated me. <laughs> They were seated. I said, what? And they were all crying. I said, why are you crying? But your testimony. I said, yeah, but you asked me to share you my testimony. And then after we finished making a long story short, he said, where are your ticket? I gave them my ticket. They tore my ticket into pieces. I said, yeah, I want to go back to Africa. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> but they, they bought me a new ticket. He says, oh, brother, we'll take you to London. And then to London, after preaching in our church, then we go to back to Africa. So I preached, man, I've never seen a revival like that. The church wept and wept and wept. Services which were supposed to be one hour became to four or five hours. People still crying on their knees, broken before God, marriage being consulted. And so after that, the Monday, they took me to Trafalgar, Trafalgar Square. And when I, they drove me there, it just like opened up. Hey, yeah, guys, I saw this place in a dream 17 years ago. Yes, this is the place I saw. So they said, all right, we'll leave you here, play with the beds. They bought, they bought me some, what, that food for the beds to play. <laughs> eh? Yeah, so, so I was going backwards. 
I was exactly what I saw. I was going backwards, mesmerized with what was seen. Then I tramped, actually tramped on someone's toe. And this guy had beard with a cigarette. Exactly what I saw. And this man, I started speaking to this man. And this man started crying, accepted Jesus. And he said he was a tramp, begging, sleeping in the streets. He had been bound by drugs. He, was, he had two degrees of low, low degrees. And he, his wife left him. So he there we knelt down. He was crying, repented, accepted Jesus. And then I said, where is your wife? I said, well, uh, she won't talk to me. I said, well, she gave me, he gave me his, her number. And I called her. And they said, can I meet you? So I got in the tube train to go and meet the wife in the restaurant. Spoke to her. She cried, repented, accepted Jesus. I said, do you know what? I've got something new to you, a miracle. I said, what is it? I said, your husband is born again, again. I said, are you serious? I said, yes, she, he wants to meet you. Do you want us to meet? He said, yes. So we met at another restaurant. We talked about reconciliation, and they reconciled. And I left them at the Baptist church, and later on he became an elder, and later on became a pastor. You see, God is what he, he does. Sometimes you cry, why me? But God has a purpose in that cry. In that cry, God has a purpose for your life. So I want to come to closing because now it's six minutes to go. Hallelujah. Say thank you, God, for six minutes. <coughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> wow. So nobody has ever felt the way you feel. Sometimes you come from a broken marriage or whatever. Nobody knows how you feel, your challenges. People are saying, be quiet. Don't be silenced by the crowd. Even tonight, you see this crowd. Let not this crowd silence your cry. Cry some more. Cry louder and come to Jesus. And that's what I did that night. I had my 20 boys in my gang, freedom fighters in Zimbabwe all with our AK-47. I knew the price of coming forward was a death sentence for me. Was a death sentence. My friends were going to kill me. It was dangerous to quit a gang. Dangerous to quit the freedom fighters. Very dangerous. But that night when I heard the message, when the preacher was preaching that night, as I said, I didn't like his finger. Every time he pointed that finger like it was bending towards me. And he would point this way like it was bending towards me. And I tried to hide all them. When he did that, I would duck down behind someone's back. But you can never hide from his finger. That night I broke down in tears. I picked up my AK-47. When I hear, I obey the word. And I followed where the word was telling me to go. And I came forward knelt at the feet of that preacher, grabbed his legs, crying his trousers, were soaked wet with my tears that night. Oh man, God is good. Soaked wet. And God, that night, as I was crying at his feet, a bomb exploded. Many people died that night. People were fleeing away for their lives. Many cars were set ablaze outside, but I was holding on at the legs of that preacher. I said, God, tonight I will not let you go until you bless me. Until you bless me. I cried louder and louder, but heaven heard me. When heaven hears you, Jesus stopped. I love that. Because when he stops, even everything in heaven stops. Just for one man, one woman, everything stops. They are all watching. Why has he stopped? Now it is time for us to dance. <laughs> oh, hey, I, I don't know whether they were dancing Zulu way or Malawi way, but not English way. 
<laughs> Hallelujah. Oh man, they were ready to dance. So here I was. Then there was commotion in heaven of the two books. The blood of Jesus erasing my name on the book to hell. Writing my name in the Lamb's book of life. Ma, oh, listen, 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 my brother. <laughs> Erased my name from the book of hell. Destined for hell. But Jesus, that night, comes into my life. When he comes to my life, the same blood writes my name in the Lamb's book of life. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> ah, ma. I think you could have done better than this, but because you are white people, you don't know. That's all right. <laughs> but then, you know, you know your name is in the Lamb's book of life. You are destined for heaven. Hallelujah. And nobody, and nobody becomes a somebody. Ten to eight. A terrible sinner, danced to, destined for, he, for hell, eight o'clock, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I mean, can you figure that out? Eight o'clock, my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. And they write Stephen. But now, I didn't know my surname. I don't know whether they write surnames in heaven. <laughs> Ah, but I didn't know my surname. The surname I have, I was given by a white missionary, Lungu. It's not my father's surname. I grew up knowing, no, not knowing my own surname. Rejected boy who only knew I was Stephen. No surname, no what. Didn't know where I came from. I didn't know my identity. But that moment when they write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, I had a brand new identity in Christ. Hallelujah. That's what is going to happen tonight. You have a new identity, young student. You have a new identity. People don't know the challenges you have. But God understands because God, Jesus, stops for you. Now, when he stopped for Batmias, he didn't go where Batmias was. No, God doesn't do that that way. He stopped and he says to his disciples, call him. And if I were Peter, I would have said, Jesus, you know that man is blind. You go to him and you ask him to come to you. No, that's awkward. You know that man is blind. <laughs> but Jesus stops. He wants you to do your part. When he stops, stand up. In your blindness, in your challenges, fumble your way to Jesus. When you get to Jesus, the answer is on this name, Jesus. When you come to him, now it was nose to nose, forehead to forehead. Jesus doesn't heal him either. He asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Now, if I were Peter again, I said, Jesus, now this is too much. <laughs> no, near Jesus, near, 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 near. Uh -uh. <laughs> This is too much. Jesus, you can see this many, and you're asking him, what do you want me to do for you? No, just heal him. No, Jesus doesn't do that. What do you want me to do? For you? Does it mean God, Jesus didn't know his problem? He knew his problem. All what he needed was a little confession of his lips. Lord, I want to receive my sight. A little confession of yourself. Then when he said, Jesus says, go, he doesn't touch him. Go, your faith has healed you. His eyes popped up. He doesn't see Peter, he doesn't see Philip, he doesn't see John, he sees Jesus. My brother, my sister, when you see Jesus, first time, man, you can't go with your, I love Jesus, no, no, you jump. Oh, man, you dance. I've seen him. When you see Jesus, you are unstoppable. Nothing can stop you because you have seen too much of God. Wow. Now, Jesus walked away. And this Bible, the Bible says, he 
followed Jesus along the way. Sitting by the roadside was gone. Sitting by the roadside was gone. Begging was finished. Loneliness was finished. Challenges were gone. You meet Jesus, all these challenges were gone. Hallelujah. Tonight, God wants to, you to stop him. Jesus is passing by. Shout louder. Shout a little louder. Don't let the crowd stop you from calling to Jesus tonight. Stop him. Heaven is ready to dance for you. Heaven is ready to dance. Shall we stand?